Hey Lakeland, so glad that you are with us today. It is gonna be a sweet morning because today we are talking with Joshua Broom. And boy, does he have a story. Uh, we're gonna be diving into the subject of pornography and some of you are like, whoa, here we go. And that's right, here we go, because this guy's got a story from a uh, porn star really to pastor, and what an amazing story it is. And, and I believe that there's just gonna be a ton of freedom that comes on the other side of this story, as well as some incredible insights around what next steps do we take. Um, if you find yourself kind of caught in that industry or caught um, just kind of consumed by uh by that reality in your life, what are your next steps? And uh, and if you have friends in that, what are your next steps uh, to come alongside them? And so it's gonna be really sweet. So welcome, Joshua, here he is, yeah, everyone's <laughs> cheering. Hey, well, I'm, I'm glad to be here and just thank you for uh, making your way out to Dallas to, yeah. to hang out and uh, man, I just love, I love sharing my story and my wife is from Iowa and we lived there for a season. Yes. So uh, the, the Midwest has uh, a piece of my heart and one of our sons were born uh, in, in that area. So Midwest is a good place to be. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Heartland. All right. So we'll just dive right into it. Take us back. Okay. Yeah. Take us back to wherever you want to take us yeah. because it's the beginning of your story shapes your, your life. And your yeah, life. absolutely. So I grew up in a small town in South Carolina and um, so I grew up in a single parent home, which is not unique, unfortunately, in today's culture. But what was unique about my upbringing was, number one, my mom was 15 when she got pregnant with me, had me at 16. And in that small town, you know, my father was the same age. But when I was born in that small town, uh, he wasn't ever in my life. So I, I knew who he was and I met him a few times. But the town was so small. Um, I mean, like one gas station, one grocery store. So being in that close proximity, I would see him on a you know regular basis. So hmm. seeing the thing that I wanted and needed, it was almost a, you know, an agitator for the the feelings and emotions that as a young man, I, I really didn't know how to feel. And, you know, in graduating with a class of, you know, around 90 people, that wasn't a commonality. Like yeah. at most, like most people that I knew, you know, I met at my basketball, football, baseball game. Their dads are there, yeah. and my dad's not there. I'm, you know, I'm I'm out in the backyard like shooting hoops by myself. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm I've, I've got bushes that are running, you know, crossing patterns that I'm that I'm throwing the football to. And so it, it was confusing when I was young. And then as I got older, it was frustrating. And I had some resentment for him, especially because, you know, he gets married, has another family and, you know, he's a great dad to them. And he's in this uh, marriage with someone else and they have, you know, the, the house and the Z71 and, and you know, the, the white picket fence and all the stuff. And we're living in government issued, you know, apartments and we're, you know, using food stamps and I'm embarrassed by all of this. And, and I see this dad that I don't have, but I can see him and being like most people, I would say, I would say most men, but most people have this high achiever personality. You know, God has created each and every one of us in his image to do great things for his glory. And part of that achieving personality, if it gets corrupted by sin, you can believe um, I need to do something so that I feel something. Yeah, yeah. And for me, I thought, well, if I become enough, you know, a good enough student, you know, a good enough athlete, so on and so on, um, I can earn the love that I'm lacking. Yeah. I can become the thing um, that gives me what I need. And I really just wanted to hear, son, I'm proud of you. Were you looking for it from him? Is no, I mean, I, no, I, I was trying to, you know, I, I was trying to consume counterfeit yeah. variations of, you know, affirmation. I thought, you know, if I got enough high fives and pats on the back, it would yeah. feel as if yeah. my father was proud of me. Mm -hmm. And I, I see porn for the first time as uh, a, an early teenager. So I was 13 at the time and being someone who I, I never saw a healthy dynamic at home. So I never saw, you know, my mom and another man in a loving relationship. So I, you know, it is, you know, Romans 12, two talks about, I was being conformed by the world because I didn't have, you know, the, the understanding of what, what does love look like? What yeah. is, what is sex? So yeah. I see pornography for the first time in this magazine and I think, well, is this love? 
And if it is, it's something that I desire. So I thought if, if I pursue women in that way, maybe I will feel the thing that my heart is longing for. Hmm. So, you know, take this, this young man who is living a very promiscuous lifestyle, very broken. Um, I didn't have a biblical worldview. I went to church early, early on as a kid. So up until like I was seven. So uh, not a lot of foundational knowledge and I'm, in the world and I'm, I'm pursuing all these things. I start modeling and acting and having some success there. And that's like the next thing where it's like, if I get the job or if I get the call back, I, I feel like I'm chosen. Mm -hmm. And, um, so interesting. So even as an athlete, it meant more to me that the coach would want the ball in my hand at the end of the game than the feeling of me making the, the shot because huh. I was chosen. He trusted yeah, yeah. me, yeah. and um, so that followed me into into college. I'm I'm studying theater in college, and really just trying to get better at a craft so that I can go and do something. Not really, you know, concerned with getting a degree or anything like that. And then the second semester of my sophomore year, I dropped out of college and, and moved to Hollywood. And I thought like, okay, it, it makes sense for me to be in closer proximity to the industry I wanted to be in. And, and I had an agent out there saying, um, you know, I can help you get jobs, but I can't represent you unless you're here. So and the industry that you wanted to get into yeah, was what? And modeling, acting. Yeah, modeling, yeah. And acting, that type of yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so I go out there and I'm doing okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm being more success. I'm, I'm having more success in modeling than I am acting, um, acting came a little easier. I didn't have to work quite as hard to get the parts because, you know, either, you know, you have a decent resume when you're modeling and say so either they, okay, you, you have to look for this campaign or, or, or shoot or whatever, or you don't acting. It's like, okay, well you got, you know, what is your, you know, yeah. do you have a real, uh, come audition, come to the second audition, you know, okay, now read for the producer so on and so on. Um, but while I'm out there, I'm doing okay. You know, I'm not struggling. I, I have community. Uh, I'm paying my bills. I'm having some success. I'm not the most successful, but not the least. And in the middle of all that, these three girls come up to me at a restaurant and they say, hey, do you want to be an actor? And I was like, yeah, great. That's what I've you been know? looking, yeah. trying to do. <laughs> yeah. Speaking and, my language. Yeah, 100%. And, and that's what I thought because, you know, in, in LA, for the most part, like where I was, you know, you're, you're looking for someone to introduce you to the thing or the person, yeah, yeah. you know, cause like you really, the, the way that you were successful, it was based on, you know, some kind of relational equity that you had or, or, uh, you know, some relationship that you were introduced into. So I thought that's what it was, but very quickly they're like, no, we're talking about porn. Mm. And essentially they were headhunters. They were, they were going, you know, they were in Hollywood, they were looking for girls and guys who were attractive mm -hmm. saying, Hey, uh, would you ever consider doing pornography? And to be honest, I'm like, okay, well, it's not something that I would want to do. Um, but at the same time, I, the, the way that I was living wasn't that different than what they were inviting me into. I just wasn't getting paid or wasn't being filmed doing it. So I'm like, okay, uh, maybe I'll meet with this agent. And I meet with him and he asked me three questions when I met with him. He asked me, um, how did I grow up? Hmm. Why am I in L.A.? And what do I hope to accomplish? And I said, I grew up pretty much me and my mom. So green light for him, yeah. you know, uh, red light for anyone listening, because that's wow. that's someone fishing for, I want to manipulate you because mm. um, you come from a broken home. So you're searching for something you don't have. Um, why am I in LA? Um, you know, I'm, I'm in this creative space. Like a lot of people are mm. like nothing there. And I think the most interesting thing I said was that I want to be famous. Mm. And, you know, being famous and being rich kind of fall in the same category where there's there's no true metric that's attached to that in in the way which you can accomplish it because yeah. it's vague. You know, if, if you believe, well, if I have enough money, I will feel a certain way. No, your heart is longing for something only Christ can give you. You know, if, if you think you're famous, well, I, I want to be known. I want to be seen. I want to be loved. Again, uh, your, lo your heart is longing for something only Christ can give you. But the world says uh, if you have money, fame, and status, you will make it you'll feel like you have something and uh, that's what I was longing for I did I couldn't put my finger on it um, but that's what I was longing for and he's like great I can give you everything you're wow. you're saying and so I say yes to one film and it 
blows up my life. You know, I get fired by my mainstream agent. Really? Uh, so this is 2006, a very different world we live in. There, so she's like, okay, your name is now associated with pornography. We certainly can't represent you. Oh. Um, I think a lot of, you know, I think a lot of you as a person, but you know, I wish you the best. We can't represent you. And then, you know, anyone that's from a small town understands, you know, it only takes one person to know one thing about your life or every person to know everything about your life. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so word gets back to my mom and I have this shame filled conversation where my mom is asking me if I had done, you know, a, a porn film. And, you know, I, I, I said that I did and she asked me why and I didn't have an answer. And then, you know, I think when you're in this like spiral of I did something I know I ought not do and I'm being lovingly confronted by this person that I love and respect um, you can either respond one or two ways you could say okay you're right I blew it um, how, how do I change directions how do I you know recalibrate how do yeah. I change course or I allow that decision to dictate everything I do next yeah and for me I isolated myself and closed myself off from her and everyone else. And I believed this is not only something I've done. This is now who I am. Wow. I had formed my identity. I think like the, the, the real basis of our, our conversation and my, my hope um, for this conversation is, is, is anyone listening to this, they understand who they are through understanding whose they are. Yeah. And for me, who I was at that season of my life, I was my mother's son. That mm -hmm. was the thing that I was most proud of. That was the thing that I clung to. And that was the thing that was most wounded. Yeah. yeah. And I hurt the only person that never hurt me. Mm. Yeah. So because I did that, I thought I I have now disqualified myself from anything that's good. Mm. So I made my bed. I might as well lie in it. Wow. So now being in that industry that I truly didn't want to be in, I thought, well, I, I might as well make the best of it. And in yeah. just my personality, it's like, well, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to achieve, <laughs> I'm going to be the best, I'm going to like, maximize it. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm oh, not wow. going to be, I, 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 I refuse to be mini, mediocre at anything. So I'm just like, okay, I'm going to be the best. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I had, you know, a spreadsheet where like, okay, I'm, I plan on making a million dollars by this point. And when I do, Growing up in, um, I've seen poverty with my own eyes, so I wouldn't say that I, I grew up in poverty, but um, in, impoverished in you know a, a westernized way of thinking, especially to what I'd been exposed to at that point. Um, I thought, well, if I had a million dollars, mm -hmm. then that would miraculously change something internal. And I truly believed that. And then I tracked it. And then I'm, when I made a million dollars, I felt the same. Mm -hmm. And I won a bunch of awards while I was in the industry. And um, four times I got nominated for Performer of the Year, which is like the biggest award you could win. And then in 2012, I won it. I won Performer of the Year. And I thought, well, that meant I was the best. You know, mm -hmm. my, my peers in the studios in that industry, they voted that I was the best. So I thought that that would validate me in a way that would eradicate the worthlessness and the inadequacy um, that I felt that it kept me up at night. Yeah. And when I won it and it didn't work, everything was amplified. The anxiety that already existed amplified. Depression that already existed deepened. And like, well, the only thing that made sense to me at that point was to make a plan to take my life. Mm -hmm. So that's where you, you yeah. got to. Yeah. So, yeah. And so this is like, two, like end of 2012, early 2013. I do a shoot and, I, and I'm on my way back from Atlanta to LAX and on the plane, I'm making a, a very strategic plan to take my life. Wow. And when I get home that there's, you know, this like, you know, that the check was like printed on like, you know, like stock, you know, paper or whatever. And it was just like thick and it was just like, I fell in my pocket and I took it out and I looked at the check. And on the memo of the check, it was clear what I was being compensated for. It was a title of a, a pornographic film and, um, I was like, well, I, I want to deposit this cause I don't want this money to go to waste. And I figured, you know, the money would go to either my mom or my brother or, or whoever. And I needed the, I needed the teller to give me permission 
to take my life. And the way that I was going to do that was that I was going to show her the thing in which caused me shame. I was going to, because generally yeah. I would go to the ATM, Dropbox, uh, mobile deposit, anything oh. other than hand the check to a person. Um, but this is exactly what I wanted. And I walk in and I slide the check across the counter and I wait on her to nod her head or say something under her breath or maybe even be bold enough to, you know, scold me for my, you know, disgusting behavior. Mm. And she didn't say anything. Went, you know, went about her business and handed me the receipt and I pivot to go walk away and, um, you know, just to, for a little bit of context. So at this point in my life, I had not talked to my mom in over a year. Hmm. Um, I had isolated myself from any real family and friends that I've had, and I had not heard my real name in over a year. Because in that industry, in that industry, you go by pseudonym. Yeah. And that pseudonym, I just allowed people to call me that. And for the most part, you know, I would only go to the gym, barbershop, you know, takeout restaurants, and to set. And I just allowed that to happen. And then anyone that loved me enough to say, hey, um, what are you doing with your life? I pushed them out of my life yeah. because I couldn't deal so with... you're just going by your stage name for yeah. all this time. Yeah. And then I, I'm walking away after I have the receipt in my hand, and then she calls out to me. She's like, Joshua, huh. how can I help you? Wow. Joshua, are you okay? Because, I mean, I was moments away from shaking my life. So I'm like shaking, sweating, like, you know, deer in headlights, like I'm, I'm not okay. Yeah. And I, I think that something prompted her to say that because when she said my name, it just like, I, what I, but what I was like woken up to was that I was withholding from my mom the fact that she didn't know if I was okay. Mm -hmm. Not like, am I doing okay? Like literally there's people dying of HIV around me. There's, there's roommates that I have that are committing suicide. There's, and there's 33 people, you know, I've been out of the industry for 11 years. There's 33 people, I think 34 now actually that have taken their life via yeah. suicide or overdose intentionally. And the, the question is my son alive was a legitimate one. Yeah. And I was withholding that information from her. Yeah. And um, so I immediately run back to my place and I call my mom and after she chews me out a little bit, <laughs> um, she tells me everything that I didn't think she would say. Hmm. She said, I love you. You're so much better than this. You're worth so much more than this. Just please come home. Hmm. And I did. So I quit that day and, um, you know, left, left everything behind. Then I was like, okay, now what, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I moved to the area in which my mom was living and I ended up in Raleigh, North Carolina. Okay. And the only thing I had in my back pocket was uh, regarding what I could do to, to make a living was um, any kind of training. So I had uh, a level one CrossFit certification. So mm -hmm. like, okay, I can coach CrossFit and that's the only thing I can rationalize me doing to make money. Um, so that goes on for two years and then in walks this, um, you know, this, this rock star gymnastics girl with, you know, uh, Iowa Hawkeye cheerleading on, on her shorts and on everything she was wearing. And, um, she was great at gymnastics and the most gorgeous thing I've ever seen in my life. And I, I walked up to her and asked her on a date and she shot me down and I <laughs> fell in love, you know, <laughs> I was rejected. So I fell in love. Um, but I, I pursued her and eventually she was like, okay, we can go on a run. And we go on a run and on that run, she, um, well, she gets, well, I get there earlier than she gets there. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say to her and how this is going to go. And all of a sudden this, this thought enters my mind and all of a sudden this like lump enters my throat. It's almost like, don't you dare lie to her hmm. because often withholding the truth from people hurts just as much or more than lying to their face. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so she gets there and I'm like, here's every bad, you know, five minute monologue of how bad of a person I am. You know, I'm this, you know, <laughs> you're I'm, selling yourself. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm like, First I'm date. this, 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm this, I'm this kid that his father didn't want. I'm this unwanted guy. And here's a list of, you know, 30 years of me doing stupid stuff that should disqualify not only you wanting to, you know, be in a relationship with me of any kind, but you probably don't even want to, you know, see my face. Mm. And I thought she was about to cuss me out or something. I, I didn't know yeah. what it was about, or maybe she gonna slap me. I, I don't know. And she looks at me and says, I want you to know that you're not defined by the worst thing you've ever done. Hmm. And you're not defined by the greatest thing you'll ever do. Cool. There's a, there's a God that exists outside of time, space, and matter. And he created everything, including wow. me and you. Those things that you told me, they might be true about you and they might impact the way that you feel, but that's not who you are. Hmm. And we just walked and talked for, you know, uh, like over an hour. And then we left and I was like pretty perplexed, but, you know, smitten over her. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we text uh, for about a week. And so this this happened on Easter nine years ago. <laughs> and uh, the following week, uh, she invites me to church. And I'm like, ah, I, I don't know about church, but I'll follow you wherever you're going. Oh. You know? <laughs> and I walk in and we're in this church and I'm, I see this big wooden sign that says, we want to love people where they are and encourage them to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And I was like, Jesus sounds cool. I know a little bit about them, but <laughs> if you knew where I was or knew if, you know, if you knew me. Yeah, where I'd been. I have no place here. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's, that's the, you know, the misnomer that many people put on themselves. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I have no place coming into the, the house of God because of who I am and what I've done. Um, because we, we wrongly think we need to clean ourselves up yep. to come to God when in reality, he's the only one that can clean up our lives. And then like right on time, I've, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people had this moment where I feel like it was just me and the pastor and he read uh, Hebrews 12 too. And he's talking about is with joy set before him mm -hmm. that he endured the cross and, and something started to enter my heart. It was this understanding of, yes, Jesus was perfect in every way. So of course he was obedient to his father and yes, he had love for his father, but if he had joy in his heart as he Goes went to, to the, the cross, cross yeah. he had love in his heart for me. Hmm. The, the person that saw them himself is unlovable. Yeah. God's love invaded me hmm. and I fell to my knees and hmm. after a, what felt like a very long time, I stood up and there was tears and snot and um, all <laughs> of a sudden uh, I didn't have this weight huh. on me anymore and I, I surrendered my life to Jesus and um, that person that I went on that walk with, um, her name is Hope, and we've been married for eight years in July, and we have four boys. And um, in that church, um, after I gave my life to Christ, uh, three days after that, you know, s same personality, but now redeemed for the glory of God. I'm like, hey, I've got a story mm -hmm. that I want to share. Will, will someone teach me how to read and study the Bible? Because I need to understand who God is so I can tell my story well. Yeah, and um, this guy, um, his name's Andrew Yates, and he had just finished up at DTS, and he was there um, as an area pastor, like overseeing small groups and some other things. And he sat down with me, and um, he's a dear friend to this day. But he was like, "Man, uh, you've told the story in the past where you're like, I was a new pastor on staff, and I, I didn't have a lot to do. Now, being in ministry for a while, I understand the new guy on staff. There's no such thing as not having a lot to do." Yeah. Um, but he was like, "Man, I just felt convicted that I needed to do something greater than um, he here's." contextually how you read scripture, you know, here's observation, interpretation, application, read the book of John, go small, go join yeah, a small yeah, yeah. group, pat, pat on the back. Here's a Bible. Um, but he sat with me, um, and, and he made himself available to me, you know, up to 10 hours, 15 hours a week for years and discipled me. Wow. And he not only taught me how to read the Bible and to study the Bible. Um, he, he, he honestly opened my eyes to how to learn in a way that I, I didn't see possible because I could read something, regurgitate it, yeah. but conceptualizing something and, and then teaching it was, is, is significantly different. Yeah. Um, but he allowed, he, he opened my eyes to learning in a way 
uh, addition to, um, I, I heard you you talk about this recently uh, in, in a message you gave, but talking about when the Holy Spirit enters you, there's this unlocking of things where you have capabilities and gifts that you just did not have. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the Holy Spirit has equipped me with this new mind and I, I'm hungry for the word of God and I'm understanding it in a way that I didn't see possible in myself. It's like, sure, regurgitating lines, sure. But like forming concepts and like, you know, all, all the things that were happening, I was just like, gosh, like this is crazy. And he just poured his life out mm. to me, but also like love be enough to, it's like I had, I had people all my life patting me on my back, but he was willing to give me a kick in the butt yeah. when I needed yeah. it. You know, um, you know, in, in Proverbs 27 talks about like the wounds of a friend. It's like, yeah. you know, sometimes you need to hear things that sting a little bit. Yep. Um, but when you receive them like with humility and they're said in love, um, they're the things that you need to hear most. Yeah. Hey, take, take us through uh, the, so you give your life to Christ. Yeah. You have the, you've got a past, obviously. Yeah. How did the process of God doing a healing work over your past yeah. start to play out? Because when you you've been two years out of the industry, but it doesn't mean that you healed. Oh no. It just and, means that you maybe buried it or walked away from it. Yeah, but I, I would say not only did I that I had not healed, I didn't heal. I wasn't I was still living, like I was still like you know, not living for Christ, for Christ right, by, right. by a mile, you know, because I, you don't know Christ and you don't have any reason. Yeah. To. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. And also it's like, I was, I was certain that, um, I was, you know, I was a carrier of this scarlet letter that no matter what I did, mm. what was most true about me is still your past, my yeah. past. Yeah. Um, so I allowed my past to dictate how I lived. Yep. Um, so that's just how I was living. So I would say that healing work, um, it was a very slow process mm. where, you know, there was a lot of excitement initially where, you know, I give my life to Christ, get baptized. And, I, you know, I, I'm working in a gym where I have a ton of relational equity with 300 people who look for, to me for leadership. Yep. They look to me you know, because that's the beauty of a CrossFit gym where it's like people, you know, they're, they're paying a premium price, not because they want to be a part of something. They're craving accountability and community. Yeah. So like that was the thing I led with and that I led with that before coming to Christ. And then I saw the value, you know, so I'm trying to figure out what does it look like for me to shift as a leader? You know, what does it, what does it look like to have Christian ethics? Like I'm, I'm, and I'm learning these things <laughs> and, you know, and, and, you know, I'm not getting everything right, you yeah. know? And, but I, I loved it. Like Andrew and I, we would have these conversations every Friday. We call them hot conversations, so honest, open, transparent. Yeah. And like, I learned to live a life of no secrets in that, you know, like if some, I, you know, I, I'm super extroverted as it is. So it's like, if my, you may want, my wife can tell you, it's like anything or, or even Lee where <laughs> like, if something comes in my head, it's like not it's seconds from coming out of my mouth, you know? <laughs> and sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's not. But, um, for me, it just like every Friday I would sit down. It's like, um, he would challenge me. Don't tell me what you did wrong and what you did right. Like when this thing happened, like when, you know, you found yourself wrestling with lust because you saw, you know, a, a girl wearing, you know, whatever at the gym, like what emotions did you feel and what did you do? Hmm. And for me, there was this, this wrestling, like I was wrestling with God when I needed to let God wrestle with me because my mind was, you know, it, it I almost became legalistic in that, well, yeah. I need to perform for God so that I can access God. I thought if I was good enough, I could get closer to him. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's very easy for, you know, scripture like John 14, 15 to be, to be misunderstood. So if you love me, you'll, be, you'll obey my commandments. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not God saying, you know, I'm, if I'm going to withhold my love from you, if you don't do what I say, or I'm going to come down on you with an iron fist, if you don't do what I say, it's actually, um, if you understand the character of God, you'll understand the tone of God. And what he's saying is, if you love me, please trust my words that I've given you 
are to protect you from yourself and equip yeah. you for the world. Yeah. There's a better way that I have, and I actually created both the world and you, and I want to help you engage with the world in a way that gives me glory and provides satisfaction and joy and peace for you. Mm. You got four boys. Yeah. Um, how are you concerned or how do you approach as they are going to get older and what's happening in the porn industry today, the accessibility of it yeah. to kids and teenagers. I mean, it was accessible for, for you and I when we were younger, but it was probably more so paper and then yeah. it landed the internet and, and things like that. How, how are you approaching parenting yeah. with your boys if you don't want them to stumble into that? Yeah. So, I mean, my, my oldest is, is five and, you know, we, you know, there, there's there's no accessibility to, to YouTube or smart devices or anything like that um, that have access to the Internet for them. But I would say, you know, the, the reality of today's, you know, society where, you know, the, the average age of exposure to pornography three years ago was 11. It's trending towards eight years old wow. today. That's you know, in, in the porn industry, it makes more money than the NBA, the NFL and Major League Baseball wow. all combined. And if you're not a sports person, uh, you take Netflix and Disney, add them together still fall short a few billion dollars. Wow. Um, 33% of all the data wow. transferred on the internet on a daily basis is pornography. Wow. So um, it's very prevalent, it's very accessible, and you no longer have to um, abstain for looking, from looking at it. You actually have to guard yourself against it because it's looking for you. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I would say uh, there's, there's this really great ministry called Defend Young Minds, and there's this book called Good Book, Good, um, Good Book Bad Pictures. Hmm. Um, and in this book, it's, it's for like five to eight year olds, but the, the mess, the message transcends, um, to adults, but it's, it talks about how, um, in the world, there are things that are bad that are depicted in pictures and movies. And in the same way, if you are scared, what do you do? You run to your mom or dad. Um, if you're hurt, what do you do? You run to your mom and dad. If you see these pictures that we've talked about that are bad, you should not be ashamed. You're not mm -hmm. in trouble, but please bring that information to me and yeah. let's sit and talk about it. Because I would say, I mean, the thing that anyone needs to know, and I wish we would have you know, shared this earlier, man, if you are a follower of Jesus and you're struggling with pornography, um, what is true is Romans 8, 1. Like if you are in Christ, con mm -hmm. like condemnation is not part of your life. Yeah. Shame um, should not be part of your life. Guilt is a healthy thing because, you yeah. know, it's God's, you know, Romans 2, 4, like his, it's his love, his, his kindness, his patience that leads us to repentance. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, you know, we, we, you know, as you say, like we need to call sin, sin. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, um, if you live in shame, you will, you will stay stuck where you are because yeah. shame is the number one weapon of the enemy. Because yeah. if you, if the enemy can distract you and isolate you from God and community, then you will stay where you are because you, you don't believe you did something wrong. You believe you are wrong. Yeah. And yeah. that's the beauty of the difference of shame and guilt. So, um, I would just say, man, if you're struggling with that and you feel ashamed, the data says you're not alone. Hmm. But what is also true is you don't have to stay stuck where you are because the the probability of you know a trusted friend in your life have having struggled with it or having known someone that struggled with it incredibly high. Yeah. yeah. So get that junk off of your chest yep. and tell somebody. Yeah. At what point did you feel like I can now tell the story without shame? Yeah. I so um there the first time that I shared my story like on uh like at a church at a different church than I was attending um because we we did like a you know like a five minute testimonial that we showed mm -hmm. at the beginning of service and um I, I spoke at this event and I shared my story and as I was preparing to share the story I resorted back to, well, I need to, I need to make people laugh. I need mm. to make people cry. You know, I need to, um, I need to create this performance art and, um, communicating is an art and you most certainly can and should be excellent at it. Um, I think, you know, 
God creates and gifts people to to be excellent at what they do, and it's for the glory of God. Um, so so don't hear me um, say that you shouldn't be yeah. all those things. And performance art can absolutely be part of preaching well. But in that point in my life, I believed I needed to portray my story in a way that deflected from the shame I felt. Hmm. Okay. So. I'm preparing this, you know, th- this this monologue, have you? And I'm 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 waiting to to go up, and they call my name, and I felt so much anxiety. Wow. And and Josh, I'll just I'll just tell you, man, like I don't get nervous. <laughs> um, a- after living the life that that, that I've lived, <laughs> you know, at, whether I'm in front of ten thousand people or or, or five hundred or, or ten, um, I, I don't get nervous. But I felt so much anxiety hmm. because I felt like I needed to perform. Hmm. And I walk up to the podium and I put my notes down. And before I said a word, I felt like in a tangible way, God's love. Hmm. And I heard him whisper in my heart, I love you. Wow. And I flipped my notes over. Huh. And I, and I I had 17 minutes to talk and I told like a two minute version of my story and uh, very poorly walked through Romans Road <laughs> and shared the gospel. And um, I was like, that was the most exhilarating thing hmm. I've ever like felt in my life. And I was like, I don't know how or what it's going to look like, but that is what I want to do the rest wow. of my life. Yeah. And, and regarding like the shame thing, it, it's like we all have a story and we can either allow our story to own us or we can choose to own our story. Yeah. And if we own our story, the only way that we can do that is we lay it at the foot of the cross. Yeah, yeah. And part of that is allowing people into your life that you can, you know, I mean, there's, uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot of like great books out there just about like the, the different depths of relationships, but you know, you don't need to share every nook and cranny of your life with everyone, but there, there does need to be at least one person that knows, you know, the, the nitty gritty parts about you that, yeah. that you need to get that off your chest. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't need to walk around with weight and, um, and that's just something that I learned to love. Hmm. And it, it just allowed me to move faster. Like the, the more freedom I found, the the the, the faster I could run yeah. and the more joy I felt. And um, being someone who felt like I was so worthless and so condemned for so long, the more I shared the gospel, the more joy I felt in my heart. Wow. So it was, it was crazy like that. It just made sense. Like growing up in a place where it's like, you know, if if you knew me, like back in the day, it's like you got to come to my grandma's house because you got to try her biscuits because they're the <laughs> best thing <laughs> in the world. And that's how I felt about the gospel. I was like, man, you would not believe what this has done in my life. And you got to know about this yeah. because it will change everything. Yeah. Yeah. So good. As you, uh, let's get into some practical stuff. Yeah. When you think about, you know, there might be, um, some people listening who are like, man, I've been entrenched in yeah. a porn addiction for a long time, or maybe uh, you're married to someone, you sense that they are, you believe they are. What is it that you would say to the person who's like, I, I want freedom? Yeah. Because it's it's empty. Yeah. It's always empty. What would you say, first thing, you must do this? Every situation is different, but I would say step one would be tell somebody yeah. Um, maybe not your spouse, but maybe so. Just depending on the circumstance. But I would, I would, in my opinion, I would find um, eventually the, you're gonna have to tell yeah, your spouse. Yeah. yeah so I would say, sure. um, I would say, first thing you should do: find someone of the same sex that loves Jesus. Mm. Tell them your struggle, and their answer is probably going to surprise you. It's either going to be, "Hey, that was a season that I was walking in." or they're going to walk with you. Yep. Um, but I'd say start there, but then like some real practical things, um, what you got to do is like, okay, now I need to take inventory of my life. Mm. Um, because, you know, there's there's a tremendous amount of neuroscience around, you know, yep. the habitual nature of pornography. And, you know, if you, if you take a CT scan of someone who is,
is on hard drugs and you take a CT scan of someone who consumes pornography on a weekly basis for over a year, it's clear that that dopamine hit is yeah. it, it's 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 strong enough where it's left tracks in your brain. So it, it's it's very uh, ingrained into you know, this habitual nature that yeah, you it's, have. It's that addictive. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Um, but at the same time. Um, our, our, our brains do still have this neuroplasticity, you know, it, it, it diminishes as you get older, but it's still, you know, brains are still malleable in a way where you can correct wrong behaviors. You can yeah. correct, but a habit needs to re be replaced with a habit. So you can't just, you know, stop doing something you've been doing for 10 years and expect, you know, like, okay, you know, I'm just gonna, like, maybe yeah. like, I in, confessed it. Yeah, I came clean. Yeah. yeah I'm never going to at the yeah. cross. Yeah. Yeah, I'm never going to struggle again. It's like, okay, now what? You know, that's the question that I spend yes. most of my time digging into. Now what? I, I want to be free. Now what? I want to yeah. give my life to Christ. Now what? So, uh, I mean, you talk about, yeah, unpacking with the Holy Spirit and just saying, God, would you reveal where are the wounds? Yeah. There's also some practical things yeah. of like, because you got to break bad behavior and put in new behavior. So what are the what are the ways? I had I mean, a pretty extreme case. So for me... I had to do no technology in my bedroom or bathroom. Um, I did that for about four years. Okay. So no technology in my bedroom or bathroom. I, I went as far where I did not touch myself. Yeah, I, I there was a I, I used a loofah, and you know when I yeah, went yeah. to the bathroom, like whatever, like I I refused to touch myself. And it's like yeah, like those are radical measures. Yeah. But I went to radical measures regarding sin. So sometimes yeah. you have to go radical measures to abstain um, from the thing you, you you ought not do. And it's like you know, and there's still Romans seven. You know, there's still, I'm going to have a, a proclivity to do the thing I ought not do. And I'm going to struggle to do the thing that I want to do. I want to follow Jesus. I mm -hmm. want to, I want to yeah. do the right thing. Yet I feel these urges to do the things I ought not do. And it's because my mind has associated comfort with these things. And I'm, I'm, I'm seeing comfort when it's actually compromised, but I need to get to the place where this is compromised. So yeah. I would say, I have to take inventory of my life. What am I watching? What am I listening to? Yep. Who is speaking into my life? And then I need to set healthy boundaries. These are, these are places that I'm not going to go. These are things I'm not going to do. You know, these are behaviors that I'm going to do. These are disciplines that yeah. I'm going to incorporate in my life. And a thing that I still do today there's these seven personal declarations hmm. that I read, and there are things that God says is most true about me. So I read those things, I read that, and then I get up and I go about my day, and then I sit down with a word um, based on what my, my morning's looking like, but that's the way I start my day. Yeah, yeah. So it's like I have to both abstain from things that lead me into temptation and I have to incorporate healthy disciplines yeah. into my life. Um, and, and then also, like, I need to remove triggers. Yeah. I have to figure out what triggers me. If it's Instagram, maybe I don't need to be on Instagram. Yep. You know, That's um, exactly right. Whatever that thing is that yeah. is your tripping hazard, yeah. just get yeah. rid of it. Because, like, if, if, like, literally, if there was something that you continue to trip over yeah. on this floor— and I saw it and you didn't, and you can continue to trip over it. And then I told you, Josh, you're tripping over this cord right here. Yeah. If you didn't either go around it, step over it or remove it, we're, we're not, you know, being smart. Yeah. yeah. You know, so there's this level of yeah. self-awareness that you have to create Yeah. because you can't be obedient or disciplined until you're self-aware. Mm, I need to be yeah. aware of this is a temptation in my life. And every time I go there, this happens. Yep. Okay, great. Remove the thing <laughs> yeah, that is yeah. leading you into temptation. Yeah. What people often want to do is they want to just say, I would just want to stop looking at it, but they forget that what got them there was you know, 10 steps before. Well, yeah, I mean, that, of that's habits. Oh, a, a thousand percent. And yeah. it's, and even before that, I mean, if you can get to the point where um, there, there's a ton of great research where um, before the Instagram thing, it's like, well, I'm, I'm going to Instagram to scroll because I, there's an emotion that's catalytic to the scrolling. Right. You yeah. know, so, it, it, you know, with men, it's like hungry, uh, hungry, sleepy, tired is, is, <laughs> is generally the times in which men find themselves 
consuming pornography. And it's so funny. Really? Uh, yeah. So like huh. the research is wild where you would think that the loneliness that occurs on holidays is, you know, associated with the highest spikes of porn use. It's not. It's the day after. Hmm. It's like you. But again, it's like where you have this high dopamine hit of you interact with people or you eat a lot of food. Yep. Then all of a sudden there's this come down and you feel lonely, tired yeah. or sleepy. And then that leads you to seeking for some kind of connection. Yeah. And then you're looking on Instagram and then you see something you ought not see. And then, you know, we, we, we go all David, you know, it's yep. like we see something we shouldn't see because we're not where we should have been. Yeah. Um, yep. And then we, we do something we shouldn't have done. And then instead of kill, killing Uriah, we clear our, brow, our browser history. Yeah. You know, and mm. it's like um, we just got to get to the point where to be like Joseph, you know, you, he had this interaction with Potiphar's wife and uh, he, he ran. Yeah. And it's like, don't man up and try to, to face temptation head on, <laughs> Re, you know, remove yourself from it. And I think it's, it's so beautiful that not only did Joseph run away from that situation, um, he, he wasn't just running from sin. He was running to God. Yeah. And if your reactionary behavior can become, um, I need to bring this emotion that I have and these things that are, you know, boiling up in me that I know that might lead me in a direction I don't want to go. I'm going to bring these things to God. Yeah. Yeah. And if you if that becomes your default, all of a sudden you'll find yourself not going and not doing yeah. things that uh, you regret doing. Yeah. Uh, what resources are you pointing uh guys and gals too. I mean, Covenant Eyes was around back in the day. I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah, so, co co yeah so Covenant Eyes, um, I have a great relationship with them. It's actually, okay. I, I have a, a free code. So my last name, so Broom30 gives you, you know, 30 days free of okay. uh, Covenant Eyes. And, um, but, but again, so Covenant Eyes is a great tool, right. but a tool is only as good as, as, you know, if you, as you use it, you right. know, if, if, if you don't use the tool in the way in which it was designed to be used, right. then it's not going to work for you. Yeah. And uh, the there's there's a lot of great like they've designed some things around it where there's the this victory app portion where you um, you there's articles and there's there's a lot of information there. Yep. Um, but the the accountability thing is key where, yep. you know, there's a VPN that's on your phone and then now there's an accountability partner that you have. And that accountability partner gets notified if you see if you if you search for or see anything sketchy, you know, right. they get this like blurry photo of, yeah, yeah. of you, you know, looking for. Or, or in some cases, it's like, you know, you were on, uh, you know, a sporting goods thing and there was a bathing suit there. But it's like, hey, uh, that, it. you know, yeah. Um, but I would say, like, if you're not willing to be honest and if your accountability partner isn't willing to be lovingly confrontational, um, mm. then it's not helpful. Yeah, yeah. Because like accountability is not um Dude, you did that again. Oh man, come knock on, it, knock it off. Yeah, yeah, knock it off, dude. Let you know. I, I'll be praying for you. It's hey, I love you. What made you do that? Hmm. Like, you you said that you were committed to like your life moving in a different direction. You you told me about the pain that this was causing, you know, in in your life, and you yeah. you were you were even thinking about leaving your marriage at one point because of this. Like, what made you say yes to that? I, I would love to know. I love you, so I'm going to ask you tough yeah. questions. Yeah. Um, and because, I mean, a, as you know, like, pastoring is far less, or loving people well is far less about telling people the right answers. It's more so about asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. And you got to love someone well. You know, yeah, create this relational equity so that I can ask good questions. And if that that's what accountability is supposed to be, and that's how it works. Mm. For the person who is uh, who's let's say getting out of an addiction, or they're coming they're coming clean, yeah, uh, for the first time, what can they expect? Will what emotions and what temptations will they face on day one, day thirty? Yeah. <laughs> Three months. I mean, you you walked this. Path. Yeah, I mean, there's gonna, there's going to be a real grievance. 
Huh. There's going to be a grieving period for the thing in which you found comfort, mm-hmm. um, whether it be alcohol or pornography or, or, or you know, the, the random hookup. Um, when you abstain from something in which you found comfort, even if you knew it was um, chaotic, um, you, you know, that's that's the way that God acquired your, you know, he, he created your mind to be like there's this adaptation yeah. that um, will happen regarding anything that's habitual. And I think that when you step away from that, there's this real grieving period. So you're going to feel depressed. You're going to feel lethargic. And, you know, Thomas Kempis has this, you know, just a lot of great research around just habit replacing habit. It's like, I need to do something with that time. You know, I need to do something healthy. And I would say um, you're going to want to isolate. And you have to fight like that. That is the, the, the strongest fight, because when you stop doing something that is sin and you're trying to pursue holiness, what the enemy is going to want you to do is the same thing that Adam and Eve did in the garden. They're going to hide, hide. from God yep. and isolate themselves. Yep. And if you're willing to say, I don't want to put myself in community, but I know where I'm seen, I can't hide. Yeah, yeah. And even if I'm not, you know, I, I don't have to show up and, you know, be the life of the party or I don't have to, you know, be someone that's leading the conversation. But, you know, maybe it's something as small as in, when I feel tempted, I go to a coffee shop, mm. you know, something simple or I go to the gym, I go for a walk. I, I do something where I'm I refuse to hide because I know what hiding leads to. Yeah. You and refuse to isolate and be alone. Yeah, yeah. I refuse to be alone because yeah. like that is the place in which, you know, you are your worst enemy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I would say like that is the feeling. But like then on day 30, it's it's almost like um, so there's this Hebrew word for humility, anava, where um, essentially there's this God ordained space in which you need you need courage to step into it, but you also need humility not to step out of it, thinking that I've got it right because mm-hmm. you'll 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 never make it. Yeah, that's so until, good because you feel like oh, I made it thirty days. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I'm and doing I would it. and I would say like doing the right thing for the wrong reason is always going to be the wrong thing, and that's going to be the thing that leads you back to where you came from, mm-hmm. and even you know ten fold. Um, because if, if you're trying to modify your behavior for the glory of God, that doesn't give God glory at all. But if you're asking your heart to be transformed by the love of God, that's different. Wow. It's so good. So, I mean, that, that's, I mean, that's the game changer. It's like, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's not this like lovey dovey, like, you know, grace is this, this like bubbly, like, you know, pillowy thing. It's like, man, there is a God that created you yeah. and loves you enough to send his son to, to be humiliated and tortured and died and rose again. And he did that because he loves you that much. Yeah. And you have breath in your lungs and you're on this earth because there's purpose for your life. You know, keeping that barometer set by starting your day in the word, starting yeah. your day in prayer. It's not like you have to read the Bible. You get to read the Bible. I don't have to pray. I get to talk to the one who made me. Mm. Um, so understanding, like changing your perspective, like that, that is how you change your behavior. Yeah. Because yeah. you can't change an, an internal problem with an external means because yeah trying to, you know, modify your behavior is antithetical to the gospel. Like you can't, you cannot change your heart, but you can be transformed. But that transformation, like Romans 12 too, again, uh, that, that is a a daily occurrence. I am a living sacrifice. So what does that mean? I have to pick up my cross daily. I have to say no to my flesh daily. I have to choose Christ daily. I have to say, you know, uh, Titus two talks about if, if I say no to ungodliness, I start to develop a hunger for righteousness. And all of a sudden the things that I feel tempted Hmm. to do, like I might still feel tempted and that might not ever go away. Like you're, you're like, that's okay. I might always want to like, you know, maybe once a month I'll have an inclining to watch porn or something like that. But guess what? For the glory of God, I can say no. Yep. I'm, I'm not going to do that yeah. because I know that there's actually something better. And even furthermore, I can say, hey, that's actually not what I'm desiring. Right. Like there. Like, God, what is it you're trying to show me? What are you trying to teach me? Or what is Satan trying to distract me from? Yeah, yeah. I love, as as you've been talking, I mean, this whole time I've heard you say it so many times that it's, 
you keep going back to the the question of God, what's going on in me right now? Yeah. So every time, whether you're talking about temptation or or or, or wounds of the past that would drive you there, it's always yeah. this: God, what are? Why am I doing it? God, where are you right now in the midst of it? And what do you want to teach me? Yeah. Um, and I just think so often when people are dealing with you know temptation or struggle, they, I mean, there's there's a reality of sometimes just having a, a trigger, a different type of trigger, a new type of habit in place. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to go for the run. I'm going to go yeah. for the walk. That's type, but that doesn't deal with the heart. Right. And it doesn't start to reshape your mind or, um, you know, put, uh, yeah, reshape your heart by putting truth uh, here that yeah. transfers down here. Yeah. So, I mean, to, to walk in newness, you have to do things that are contrary yeah. to what you've done in the past. And, and I think like in, in, like having an introspective conversation with God yeah. saying, God, um, these are things that I'm feeling right now. And I know if uh, I allow this thought, if I hop on the train in which this thought is going to take me to, I know it's going to take me to a place that I don't want to go. Um, but could it be that this thought or this emotion, is there something that you want to communicate to me? Is there something that I need to die to? Yeah. Is there something that I've suppressed that you're trying to bring to the surface that you want to you know, put on the altar and be burned? Um, yeah. Is there something that you want me to let go of? Because those moments of temptation can also be moments of consecration where you have this interaction with God that is beautiful because I said no to the thing my flesh wanted, yeah. and I chose to say, you know what? Even though I want that, God, I'm going to seek you in this moment. I'm going to lift my hands towards heaven and say, God, what are you trying to show me through what seems to be a perversion? What is it that my heart is actually longing for? Yeah, yeah. How do you equip someone, uh, or how do you follow up and encourage someone the day after they've fallen? to the person that's um, fallen, the way that you would encourage them is like, hey, um, look at how far you've come. Hmm. Like, do you remember when you used to watch this every day? Yeah. And like, yeah, like let, let's not, you know, let's, let's not address the fact that, you know, you, you, you felt something and you gave into it, but man, let's, let's use this to fail, to, to fail forward. What, yeah. what was it that caused you to slip up? Oh, it was this? Okay, great. Man, how awesome is it that we can put our finger on the thing yeah, in which yeah. caused the problem? So let's not be a dummy and do it again, right, uh, yeah. but let's assess. Let's take, let's assess what happened and let's grow from it and know that like God doesn't love you any less because you fell. His love for you is not indicative of you you know, performing. Right, right, right. He loves you regardless, but that does keep you from the totality of his love and way in the way you perceive him. Yeah. So don't run from him in those moments, run to him and say, you know, I, I repent. I want to turn back. I want to course correct because of your love, your patience and your kindness. Like God's not holding his fist at you. He's opening his arms to you yeah. saying, let me love you. And what can we learn from this? Okay, great. Because often sometimes like if you assess your failure in that, you'll actually end up more free than you would have been if you hadn't fallen because you were just yeah. trying to white knuckle it. And there oh. was there was something that you hadn't yet let go of that you needed to confess or feel, say, OK, oh, that I thought it was this. No, it's actually this. Yeah. 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 I don't think anyone ever probably, you know, has a failure and, and looks at it through the lens of man, we're going to learn and be so much better on the other side <laughs> right. of this, especially when it comes to falling to pornography. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, people respond with the, oh, I can't believe I fell again. And they almost, they restart the clock. Well, yeah. They, they and, restart the... And if you have that mentality, you 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 feel like, well, I have to start over. To tell us die has nothing to do with starting over. Mm, it is finished. It is finished, yeah. Right. It's paid for, signed, sealed, and delivered. So yeah. there's nothing that you can do to qualify yourself for heaven. There's yeah. nothing you can do. Right, right. So substitutionary atonement has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with Christ. Yeah. So freedom is because of what Christ has done, not because of your behavior. Yeah, right. But you but but your understanding of what you have access to does have a lot to do yeah. with how you live your life. Yeah. But if you say, hey, um, I blew it. 
I'm not going to do that again because I know what it cost me and I can identify why I blew it. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. All right. Last question. Yeah. Do you think I would look good in a mustache like yours? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll see how that plays out. <laughs> see if that ever happens. All right, everyone, give it up for my man, Joshua. So appreciative. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so glad. So glad to be here. That was awesome. Yeah.